The Philippine National Police is fortunate to have a documentary that celebrates its contributions to nation building that on occasion helped change the course of Philippine history. This film, entitled Tagaligtas, is about the Special Action Force, the PNP's elite multi-role strike force. Much about the South is classified, but uh, with Tagaligtas, the public will learn about the crucial roles it played in restoring the country's freedom and democracy, its defense of it, and the shield it provides society against terror, insurgency, and criminality. I thank everyone who made Tagaligtas possible, namely the officers and men of SAF, their leaders in the chain of command, the documentary team, the major sponsors, and the producers of Tagaligtas, former President Fidel V. Ramos, the founder of SAF, and former Secretary of the Interior and Local Government, Rafael M. Alunan III, himself an honorary member of SAF. The men who passed through the portals of SAF are now either retired or occupying other positions in the Philippine National Police and in the national or local governments. They have, in my view, uplifted the PNP's quality of law enforcement and internal security that is gradually transforming its ethos to one that the public will hopefully admire and cherish for generations. Patrol at night. I remember patrolling in Ligaspi. I remember patrolling in the rice terraces in Banawi. Heli drop kami. Malayo sa kabias nanta. Malayo sa sentro. I entered their lair. Uh, I had nothing with me except one magazine of uh, caliber 45. Sumigaw. Sir, dapa. Tapos yun na puto ka na. Deliberate yung fire namin. Pak, 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 pak. Tapos, mamaya, nanggagaling naman sa iba yung puto. Pak, pak, pak. So, nagmamaneuver. Nasa takot sila dun eh. Alam nila. I said, I think I'm going to die. Suddenly, my, one of my men pulled me up. Okay, so let's go. So, you're actually willing to bet your life, not just for the mission, but the people around you, the people you're with. We are in the business of managing violence. It's in the territory. We're trained to do that. It's natural for us. In fact, we are natural people to do those things. It's an honor to lead a very special group of disciplined men. the early 1980s, a decade after martial law was declared, the streets were filled with unrest. The air was thick with threats from all fronts. With the impending chaos facing the country, the government needed to do something drastic. It was during these troubling times when the idea of creating a highly specialized strike force was formed. Then, uh, PC chief, uh, Major General uh, Fidel B. Ramos uh, instructed me to form a study group composed of officers who had uh, various foreign training uh, to uh, put up a special unit for the Philippine Constabulary. For President Ramos, the best way to quash insurgency was to win the hearts and minds of the people, a creed that goes back to his years as a young weapons platoon leader under National Defense Secretary and would-be Philippine President Ramon Magsaysay. Ang tinuturo ni Secretary Ramon Magsaysay sa amin, Boys, use all-out force with the right hand 
an all-out friendship with the left, winning the hearts and the minds of the people. Yan po ang umpisa ng Special Action Force. During the martial law years, President Ramos was wearing three hats. These roles enabled him to carry out Magsay Sai's vision. Here was my chance as uh, concurrently Chief of the PCINP and Vice Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces at the time. One special action force that could respond immediately would be uh, in our arsenal of uh, law enforcement and military organizations. Our dream at that time was to create a very, very special elite unit composed of officers, highly selected, hand-picked officers and men who can do almost any military or police job that would be required of him. A very highly trained and a very highly specialized unit that can go anywhere in the country, strike at any enemy organization or any enemy force. The guidance of Jar Ramos and Jar de Villa was, uh, we want a small team, a small group that can strike hard. We dare to go and look for the enemy. To form an elite unit of men highly proficient in combating insurgency and terrorism, a core group of select officers was immediately tasked to handle training and formation, headed by then PC Major Avelino Razon. I had a group of officers who came from uh, different uh, trainings. Among the elite young officers who made the cut were Rosendo Ferrer, who trained with the Special Forces at Fort Bragg, USA, Rodrigo Fernandez, a graduate of the U.S. Army Ranger School in Fort Benning, and Samuel Pagdilao and Villamor Bumanglag, who both underwent rigorous training in the British Royal Marine Commando Corps. All of these disciplines in these uh, courses that uh, they went through, we fused together so that uh, we could uh, come up with uh, what would uh, now be called the Special Action Force. The whole idea is that the unit or part of it must be able to reach its target either by land, by water, or by air, or by parachute, if necessary. The unit, as we, as we design it, is highly mobile to be based in Camp Krame, but can be projected on short notice under the concept of rapid deployment to any part of the country in the Philippines. But physical training was not enough. Values formation was also on top of their priority list. So, no martial law, pag naka-uniforme ka, ilang ang tao sa'yo? Takot. That's something we had to change. They had to change the way they behaved. They had to change their orientation. Iibahin nila yung definition nila kung ano yung trabaho nila. Devotion to duty. Dedication to your assigned duties and the mission of your unit is uh, of the utmost importance. Ikalawa, to do a good job according to the rule of law. Avoid uh, any violation of human rights or civil rights or political rights, which is uh, the right of all Filipino citizens. But at the same time, to be able to use just enough force to win the situation. Their one-word mission, to be Tagaligtas, protector of the people, defender of democracy. You have to be very strong. You have to have the right attitude. I pretty much have my mindset. I'm going to join this unit. In fact, I was already puking my guts out. <laughs> we push everybody to the limit. Ang nakasulat lang sa placard, there's nothing in this course but pain. To develop, organize, and train organic personnel in the furtherance of the assigned mission, conduct counter-terrorist operations in urban and rural areas. Commando type, unconventional warfare against lawless elements with minimal direction and control. And 
search and rescue operations during calamities and catastrophes. These are just some of the duties expected of a SAF trooper, but to be able to perform them, a SAF trooper must undergo training so intense that in its original form, only 10% of the recruits made the cut. Fort Santo Domingo, Laguna, 10th City. For four months, a SAF recruit will call this home as he undergoes the commando course, the SAF Foundation course that has been polished, reshaped, and perfected over the past 29 years. A five kilometer run, three times a day, carrying 18 kilos of gear, push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, and other calisthenics under the blistering sun. Every day, SAF recruits undergo severe physical training that separates the men from the boys. At the same time, they learn and develop various combat skills, such as weapons handling, marksmanship, combat life-saving techniques, and map reading and navigation. Training is as much a test of character and fortitude as it is of physical strength and stamina. It is designed to enable men to make strategic decisions in the face of danger and adversity. It's the willingness to serve and die doing that job. Yun ang napakabigat. Kaya ang um, basic requirement was it should be, he should be a volunteer officer or volunteer soldier to join SAP. Extensive yung interview portion namin sa recruit. Tatanong yan, ba't gusto mo pumasok sa SAP? Kailangan yung individual na may initiative. They, they should be patriotic. Kasi alam nilang mahirap yung dadaanan nila eh. Training pa lang, mahirap na eh. And much more doon sa deployment nila. Before a uh, SAF trooper graduates from the uh, commando course, they have to undergo the test mission. And you cannot graduate unless you have an encounter with the enemy. Yung moto kasi ng SAF, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. So, kahit anong hirap yan, uh, doon namin na-realize nung nag-tismisyon na kami. Yun palang purpose sa kahirap-hirap ng training ng daanan namin sa SAF. It is during commando training that the recruits are introduced to SAF's basic unit, the eight-man team. In urban combat or jungle warfare, whether on land, in the air, or at sea, the unit is a force to be reckoned with. They can be deployed anywhere, anytime, and at a moment's notice. Turn on the eight-man uh, team as the smallest component of the SAF uh, unit. They can be further broken down into two uh, firing teams no, of equal number of men, that's four to four. The eight-man can handle as much as 40 to 80 people at any one time. They should be prepared to be at least uh, three hours to four hours of fighting before they can even be reinforced. So it's training, it's equipment, it's uh, discipline. The emphasis on being a small but lethal unit reinforces the bond between team members and everyone, even the commanding officers, feels the strong stress on brotherhood. Tapos, nakadepend siya sa isa't isa. Ako, nakadepend ako sa kanila. Sila nakadepend sa akin. Kumbaga sa ano, parang yung buhay ko, konektado sa buhay nila, yung buhay nila konektado sa akin. The much coveted Black Beret shows that its wearer has gone through the extremely difficult SAF basic training course. The beret is worn only after the recruit has faced the enemy in the field of combat. Pinaghirapan namin to. Pawis, dugo, lahat. Nandito na. Pag nabigyan ka ng beret, parang... Sabi nga nila eh, parang wala kang kamatayan eh. Ito kasi yung pride ng kahit sinong sap eh. Ito, 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 black beret na to. So, hindi mo may sosot to kung hindi ka graduate ng SAF Ranger. Siya yung pinakamahirap na training, even sa ibang units sa armed forces. On the beret is the SAF insignia, symbolizing the different courses that transform an average law enforcer into a modern-day warrior. SAF's foundation course, the commando course, is represented by the tabak, or jungle knife. 
The wings symbolize the Airborne Corps. The crosshair represents the urban counter-revolutionary warfare corps, and the water embodies the scuba corps. The hard physical training instills in each recruit discipline, responsibility, integrity, and love for country. It is law enforcement on a whole new level. For the few who graduate from commando training, this only marks the beginning of their lifelong mission to be Tagaligtas. And though SAF's functions may have changed over the years, adapting to the needs of the times, this basic calling to serve and protect has not changed. We were trained and we were conditioned to fight to the best of our ability, to fight the enemies of the state, making a difference wherever you are, whatever circumstances you're in, I think that's the most fulfilling. Sinabi ko nga doon sa father in ko, alaga mo ng pamilya ko because hindi kayo magpapahuling buhay. The order was to, to defend at all costs. Hindi ko alam kung yung nga nandun na ibang sundalo sa gate, eh, lalaban ba sila o tutulong ba sila sa amin. Pero sigurado ako na yung SAF trooper doon na kasama ko, kasama ko yun. Lalaban kami doon. Patay kung patay na kami. We were ready to die uh, for the good of the country. It all began in the early 1980s, when rumblings of discontent were spreading through the armed forces of the Philippines. There were a lot of uh, protests, and I said the insurgency was uh, growing. The military was not in a good light as far as the civilians uh, viewed them. There were a lot of reported military abuses during that time. There was a growing rift because of the situation of President uh, Marcos's uh, health. It was rumored that he was not in good health at that time. Certain forces were trying to consolidate so that uh, in the event that uh, President Marcos would go, then they would take over. What started as small group discussions became the Reform the Armed Forces Movement, or RAM, attracting many officers including SAF troopers. We can feel the frustrations of some commanders, especially the young officers on the ground. That's probably why we were so confident that we were putting up the RAM. The Reform Armed Forces Movement was for attaining reforms in the armed forces through peaceful means. But when Senator Ninoy Aquino was uh, assassinated at the uh, International Airport, things changed. The leadership of the Reform Armed Forces Movement, they were already thinking of conducting a coup d'etat. And uh, that was the, I think, the turning point. The Special Action Force was designated an important role in the coup d'etat plot. The original plan for SAP was not to protect Rami, actually. My assignment was to protect the command group, which was originally to be placed in Villamor Air Base because of the communication, because of the airport. The ultimate goal was an assault on Malacanang Palace, the seat of presidential power. It also entailed capturing Camps Crame and Aguinaldo, the strongholds of military power. In January 1986, the fraudulent snap elections took place Massive cheating at the polls and the civil disobedience that followed became the trigger for Ram's planned coup. Tensions across the country continued to escalate. Malacanang uncovered the coup plot, and when some Ram officers were arrested, a hastily revised plan swung into action, and it came with a breakaway announcement that shocked the nation and the world. With a breakaway announcement that shocked the nation and the world. I withdraw from the president because of this uh, circumstances in which our uh, country finds ourselves today. And there was this news, uh, breaking news, that uh, a helicopter had, had landed in uh, Camp Aguinaldo and was bringing arms from Cagayan. And shortly after that, uh, Minister Enrile and General Ramos went on air to say that uh, they were breaking away from the Marcos government. 
I task Sunny Rason and Sinong Pierre to stay with Jan Ramos, make sure that he is protected or secured because he is the symbol of the leadership in the military. We have to have a leader respected by everybody and we have to secure them. Soon after his defection, Ramos returned to his headquarters at Camp Krame, vulnerable to Marcos forces and with only 60 SAF troopers on guard. I still remember that, that day. Uh, Suddenly, for some reason, there was there was no one manning the, the, the gates of Camp Krame, you know, not even the, the headquarters people. Or, so we actually put one one team in each of the gates of, in each of the four gates of Camp Krame. We in charge of the gate one, we in charge of the gate of Salipot. So we were tactical, we were secure of Camp Krame. Because events were unfolding so fast in Manila, SAF officers across the country responded just as quickly to reinforce the troops. Then I announced that, uh, gentlemen, we're about to make history. Those who do not want to be part of it, stay here. And that's how SAF everybody wanted to go. For four days, SAF troopers stood their ground at Camp Krame. I looked through the fence, and that was one night when there was already people power, and I could see the, the Marines on the other side of uh, Santolan. And they were also positioned around. And they were just right across. It was a futile mission. We, we were aware, but uh, that, that was the order. And somehow we were the ones uh, who were supposed to do it. Disobey those orders, not carry out anything that will inflict harm, bodily injury, and violence upon the people's power out there. Fight for your country! Fight for your country! As they confronted the clear and present danger, the troopers became fully aware that their lives were at stake. But it was the unexpected show of people power that strengthened their resolve to complete their mission. Kitang kita namin yung mga dumarating. So every time na sasabi nila, oh, andyan na yung mga Marcos loyalists, magsisigawan yung mga tao, mag-iipon din sila doon sa, sa gate. Yun ang nagpapalakas loob sa amin. Sabi ko, as things moved on, we, we realized that oh, no way, no way that you know, Marcos will, will order something that will kill all of these people. So I think that gave us some uh, consolation. You, you knew it was the moment. The numbers swelled by the hour. The spirit of Edsel had electrified the country. In the end, it's the people. And we believe at that time that we are supported by the people and we were not wrong. It was an unprecedented show of solidarity. I can only describe it as a mystical experience. God was our commander in chief. I put it simply this way. And assuming 1% of the 1 million were armed, and not one did the foolish thing by pulling out their gun and firing a shot in anger. Because had that happened, uh, there would have been a bloodbath. I consecrate myself to the to the service of the nation. So help me God. So help me God. But this half was also the backbone of our Amkrami uh, defenses during the first couple of days when we really had just a handful of uh, defenders and rebel soldiers in Camp Krame in uh, helping the military rebels kami win the victory peacefully without any bloodshed and the PC staff owns a lot of the credit for uh, that happening. It's a people power of 86. Pag may magsasabi dyan, sabihin ko sa inyo na single-handedly siyang hero. Hindi sa tuyon. Ang hero nun talaga, yung mga tao. He had a brother who was with the rebels, and his brother called him up and said, you know, uh, uh, umalis na kayo dyan, pupulbusin namin kayo dyan, ganun. Madilim, di mo alam kung sino yung kalaban mo sa loob. Si Army, Marines, SAP. Yung pangikipaglaban, na-train kami dyan eh. Pero ang mahirap ng decision doon, kalaban mo yung kapwa mo sundalo. O yung mista mo. Before I could do that, actually, I had to lock myself into a room, internalize, and, and evaluate if this is something that I really have to do or need to do.
despite the euphoria from people power. First three years of the Aquino government were the most vulnerable to coup attempts. Discontented with the government they helped install, the Reform the Armed Forces Movement, or RAM, led by then Lieutenant Colonel Gringo Onasan, launched several coup attempts between 1986 and 1989. Two of these almost toppled the government and turned brothers in arms against each other. Rebel troops attack centers of gravity, Malacanang. Camps Crame and Aguinaldo. And the government broadcast station, PTV4. In response, the government quickly mobilized its counterforce to quell the rebellion. For the PC staff, the critical area of engagement was Channel 4, where they engaged rebel forces to retake it and force them out of their stronghold in a nearby hotel. The Constabulary Integrated National Police might not have been able to handle the retaking of PTV4 and uh, Camelot Hotel with just ordinarily trained police officers. Sabi sa PTV4, talaga doon namin na ano, yung ganito, yung tulad kalapad yung pader. Na ano kami ro, siya pulap kami ro. Ang mission namin, magmula dito sa Krami, Camelot Hotel. Punong-puno yan ng mga kapwa namin sundalo rin. So, ang mission namin ay i-plus out sila dyan. Uh, Saf went to PTB4 and captured the rebels that were uh, holed out there. And uh, later on, secured the Camelot Hotel. Although 14 Saf troopers were injured in the process, in the end, it was a failed rebel attempt. While the August coup attempt was short-lived, military rebels struck again in 1989. On November 30, rebel soldiers belonging to the RAM SKP YOU launched another coup attempt that would last seven days. Better funded and more organized, it would be the bloodiest in Philippine history. At the onset, the rebels took Villamore Air Base, Sangli Naval Station, and Mactan Air Base, swiftly controlling the assets of the Philippine Air Force. Once again, Malacanang, Camps Aguinaldo, and Crame were simultaneously attacked. Ramos was inside the DND building and uh, hours later, it was already being bombed by by Tora Tora planes, the rebel planes. Kitang kita namin pati yung pagbomba ng Tora Tora sa sa Ginaldo, tinira din tong Kramis, uh, sunog yung tuktok ng ano yung headquarters namin. And I told myself, the, the Cory government is really teetering on the brink of defeat. They contacted uh, Sunny Razon. I said, uh, I'm join you guys in Krame. On the other side of Santola, we could see the shelling uh, taking place. We were listening to the radio. We heard a Christmas carol in the background. And the guy beside me, a uh, sergeant, just broke down. And he asked me, he says, uh, why? Why is this happening? We were manning a machine gun nest. Uh, Sunny Razon, uh, Jojo Angan, Conrad Capa, Noli Talino. Everybody was preparing for a big battle because General Blando uh, had 2,000 troops somewhere in Green Hills in the Unimart area. Saf's other concern was to secure the battle staff, led by Chief of Staff General Renato de Villa, who held office at Camp Aguinaldo. Apparently, they have selected 70 men to purposely to, to uh, snatch Secretary Ramos, uh, General de Villa, who was then the Chief of Staff, and then and then sila Secretary Luigi Santos. SAF promptly sent four teams to augment us. The SAF commander at the time was uh, uh, Hermogenes Ebdane. During that time, what crossed my mind, uh, this is the way the CPP, NPA, MNLF, and MILF feel when they're being bombarded. It took two days for government forces to fully regain control of Camp Aguinaldo. Despite the air attack on Camp Crame, 
It was never assaulted by rebel troops. They were led by Lieutenant Colonel Rafael Galvez, battalion commander of the 1st Scout Ranger Regiment. Among them was Captain Danilo Lim, leader of the Young Officers Union. Uh, your immediate action in any uh, encounter in the field is to always occupy the high ground. As a scout ranger, occupy the high ground because the high ground would give you distinct advantage. So in an urban setting, without any hills and mountains to occupy, the high grounds were the tall structures in, uh, in Makati. SAF, which was in one part of Ayala, was having a sniper war with the scout rangers. In Shilar Life, may bakante tapos andito yung building kung saan andun yung mga, mga tropa, mga SAF. Hindi sila makatawid dito, itong open space na to. Dahil ini-snipe sila. Ini-snipe sila. Siguro about 50 meters yung haba, no? So, gusto nilang pasokin yun. Sap, sap, kayo naman ang mauna. So, di, sir, eh, general yun, eh, tinyente lang kami. Sir, tayo raw mauna. O, sige. Alam mo, pag-turn mo na, talagang ahabuli ng sniper yun, ng bala yung paa mo. Nung turn ko na, talagang dasal din ako. Lord, pala ka na. Pagtakbo ka nun, talaga yung ping, 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 ping. Yung, eh, simento yun. Kaya, ano pa yun eh, yung ricochet niya, di ba? So, kaya pag nakakross ka na, wow! Parang uh, baseball eh. So, save! <laughs> Sav and the Scout Rangers were tourists and civilians, trapped inside hotels, condominiums, and residences. The task of taking them out of harm's way fell in the hands of then Under Secretary of Tourism, Rafael Alunan. So it fell on my shoulders to uh, look for a way to penetrate the battle zone and get the tourists out. I engaged the Rangers in negotiations with the release of trapped tourists and other non combatants. I sensed from their agreement to talk that I guess it would just be a matter of time before the coup would end. That particular incident showed that they were sincere about releasing the hostages and uh, finishing off the negotiations. Hindi pwedeng gawing hostage yung mga yun dahil counterproductive. So what we did was we allowed the evacuation of these tourists and the residents in the area. And sabi ko nga, let's uh, uh, pakita natin that uh, uh, we are good soldiers. With the tourists and civilians safely out of the way, the fighting ceased. Before long, the rebels realized that they were fighting a losing battle. A day later, the rangers returned to their barracks. Sabi ko, talo. And uh, let's just, the best thing we can do is right now is... Uh, while kaya nating patagalin ito, uh, ganun din eh. Ano? Let's just turn this uh, impending defeat into a psychological victory. So ganun na lang. Once again, freedom and democracy prevailed. This is only the first time I'm realizing that fully that we in effect help save the country a special action force. Sometimes uh, uh, people uh, resort to violence, resort to fighting the government because nobody is listening to them. So, labanan niya ng estratehiya, labanan niya ng, ano, ng taktika. I announced there that we are not going to wage war, but rather we are going to wage peace. Insurgency is a deeply rooted problem that has plagued the country for decades. When it was conceived, one of the roles assigned to the Special Action Force was counterinsurgency, to suppress the armed threat and to bring peace and development to the countryside. To quash the insurgency, SAF troopers were tasked to strike its heartland. Create the Home Defense Force 
and stay in the barangays, in the most influential barangay. Be with the people and do not abuse. That's the real concept of the heartland. Use all out force with the right hand and all out friendship with the left. Use them together in a balanced manner. With President Ramos, the responsibility for internal operations shifted to the DIL GPNP from the AFP. The counterinsurgency strategy employed by the Ramos administration was codenamed Lambat Bidag that involved four phases to clear, hold, consolidate, and develop. The clearing phase required our men in uniform to clear the areas of armed uh, insurgency. The second was to hold the areas that they cleared. Third phase would be secure or consolidate phase. This would allow now local governments to re-establish their presence and then start delivering on minimum basic needs to win back the hearts and minds of the people. The military and the police would provide the support. The last phase, which is the development phase, would begin once the local governments had fully established their presence. Civil society, uh, the business sector, and other institutions would be encouraged to now pour in their resources to develop their communities. So that's the complete process, uh, which we call Lambat Pitag. Each Heartland mission entails staff troopers to immerse in rebel-held communities for weeks or even months at a time. Bago kami mag-jump off, pinag-aaralan na naman yung area. May area study na kami. Tapos nagkakaroon kami ng pinatawag namin doon, eh, brief back. Parang ikikwento na namin yung mangyayari doon sa operasyon namin. Their tactic is to create fear among the people so that they can control them. So what we do is to go there and uh, occupy the place and remove the threat. The Heartland strategy is designed to gradually constrict the insurgents' movements, control, and influence until they are defeated. In this role, SAF confronts the armed threats in the field while gaining the trust and confidence of the people. We should understand the underlying causes of this problem, which are poverty, injustice, ignorance, among others. So we have to address this problem, and this we did. So ang ginawa namin nga ay yun na to attract, to win over the cooperation and sympathy of the uh, people who are being uh, recruited or uh, the population at large. The war was fought far from the battleground and closer to home. Sinimbahan ko lahat. Simba ko sa sa Katoliko, sa Protestante, para ikayati. Samahan nyo naman kami dito. Kaya nga bayanihan eh. At yung nga hinihikayat buong ba na kayo, uh, manumbalik sa gobyerno, sa pamahalaan, at uh, sama-sama tayong ano, tumulong, pagtulungan itong problema. SAF troopers are trained to always conduct themselves with dignity, self-restraint, and compassion. Service is nothing but expression of love. Even those people whom you think don't deserve your love. And I think SAF have that kind of mentality. No? They can be very hard and tough against the enemies of the state, but at the same time, they can be very gentle and loving uh, towards the community. And what is the result of this uh, strategy? This, the result is less encounter, less people killed, less people injured, but more people surrendered. So that's what I mean about breaking the backbone of the enemy without firing each shot. Peace is the responsibility of everybody. People who want to defend themselves and live normally should have that right to peace. After waging and winning the peace, goodbyes proved to be difficult. Halos ayaw kaming paalisin ng mga tao doon. Nag-iiyakan yung mga tao pag uh, umalis na yung, yung company namin. Kasi ang ginagawa namin sa mga tao, we uh, treat them as member of our family, as, as yung staff family. When they feel secure, the people feel secure, 
They feel that they can go on with their normal way of life, that they have peace of mind. The Heartland campaign isn't just a test of skill, but more importantly, of their character as peacemakers. At the end of the day, uh, they are our brothers. And God has taught us that you are our brother's keepers. So while we fight it out to the hilt, uh, we should also think there should be compassion in our fighting. We should be fighting not for the heck of it, but to achieve something, and that is for the betterment not only of yourself, but also even those who are fighting against the government. In this struggle, it is the person, it is individual behind the gun that matters. So kinakailangan yung, yung psychological mindset eh, in the correct perspective. We just don't fight for the sake of fighting. No? Ayaw namin yan. No? Ang gusto namin kapayapaan. Global terror rose in the early 1990s after Russia's defeat in Afghanistan in 1989. America's CIA and Pakistan's ISI collaborated in training and arming Muslim Mujahideen to defeat the Russians. Among them was Osama bin Laden, founder of Al-Qaeda. MNLF and MILF fighters volunteered to fight in Afghanistan. After Russia's defeat, some Mujahideen returned home to form the Al Harakat Al Islamiyah, better known as the Abu Sayyaf. In the war against terror, uh, intelligence is the most important ingredient to detect their plans early, determine who they are, and then interdict before they can carry out their plan. When they are unable to prevent it, then we call on other forces to suppress. Uh, the threat. Like all operations of SAF, these are all sub rosa. These are, these are not really publicized. There were many national security concerns. The NPA, MNLF, MILF, Abu Sayyaf, and Lost Command groups that got in the way of peace and development in Mindanao. Negotiating peace was essential to defuse those threats. The 1976 Tripoli Agreement, the creation of ARM in 1989, the settlement with the MNLF in 1996 and the ongoing talks with the MILF are all part of the long and winding road towards lasting peace. The Abu Sayyaf, led by Afghan veteran Abdurrajak Janjalani, became the face of jihad and terror in the Philippines, notorious for their attacks on Christian churches, raids, bombings, mass murder, rape, gruesome beheadings and kidnapping. Among those kidnapped was Charles Walton, an American missionary who was taken in Sulu in 1993. Close cooperation amongst the DILG, the Libyan Embassy, other intermediaries known to Janjalani, and SAF resulted in Walton's liberation. In due time, the Abu Sayyaf's direct links to Al-Qaeda became known. January 6, 1995, a fire broke out in Suite 603 of the Doña Josefa apartments. Responding firemen and a police team discovered a bomb-making factory and other incriminating evidence that pointed to a massive terror plot in the works. Alerted about the incident, Avelino Razon and Napoleon Taas, both ex-SAF and later assigned to the Presidential Security Group, rushed to the scene to investigate. The first thing that caught my attention was the computer. I secured it, placed it in my bag, and I carried it. And we continued on with the investigation where we were able to find uh, pictures of the Pope, the uh, Sotana, the priests, and explosive uh, materials, IED, improvised explosive uh, materials like uh, pipe bombs. When we reported this to the U.S. Embassy, they sent over a team from New York. They were the ones who identified through the photos and data in the laptop that the guy that escaped was Ramsey Youssef, bomber of uh, the World Trade Center in 1993. The discovery uncovered Al-Qaeda's Bojinka plot 
to blow up 11 U.S. airliners, potentially killing some 4,000 passengers en route to the United States. The bombing of PAL Flight 434 in December 1994 was a dry run. From our end, however, what is more revealing are the uh, pieces of documents. The attache case of uh, Ramsey Yosef, receipt for the computer, his address book, telephone directory, bomb making manuals. That's where we got uh, most of the information. It was the first time that SAF learned about Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi Youssef, and his team of terrorists. One of them, Abdul Hakim Murad, was to crash a 12th plane into the CIA in Langley, Virginia. That was the only time that it dawned on us that uh, Al-Qaeda was already here in the Philippines. And they even conducted training for the Abu Sayyaf in Basilan. And after that training, Ramsey Youssef went to Cebu, and after some time in Cebu, went to Manila and started planning for the assassination of the Pope. There was so much information that I mean, it was probably going to take years to really fine tune and develop what all uh, came from that. This was really the first, I would say, significant major terrorist incident, uh, you might say, in the world where such a, a, a plot was discovered. The evidence in Suite 603 also revealed a complex web of assassination plots that Youssef and his team would execute within months of each other. Assassinate U.S. President Bill Clinton during his state visit in November 1994. Assassinate Philippine President Fidel V. Ramos at an opportune time. And assassinate John Paul II in January 1995 on World Youth Day. The Abu Sayyaf was believed to have provided Yusuf and his team with security and logistical support. In turn, they would take the credit if the plot succeeded. Months later, Ramzi Yusuf and his accomplices were captured and turned over to the American Federal Bureau of Investigation and brought to justice. One of the things that came out of this too was that all of the information and evidence which the Philippine government discovered, in other words, uh, Ramzi Yusuf's computer, uh, many of the different things dealing with the plot to uh, kill President Ramos and all these things was admitted as evidence as evidence in the courts in New York and were helpful uh, in a large part uh, for conviction of, of those three individuals uh, for life sentences uh, in, in jail. The foiling of Al-Qaeda's plots was a major breakthrough in global counterterrorism that opened the doors of international cooperation. The Yusuf case prompted FVR to call for a counter-terrorism summit. Nineteen countries attended the summit. General Edgardo Aglipay was SAF commander then and helped me to organize it. I personally handed FVR's letter of invitation to key heads of state, including Pakistan, Egypt, and Israel. That summit was held in absolute secrecy in Baguio in February 1996, and that would be the first in Asia. The Walton kidnapping the capture of Ramzi Youssef and the counter-terrorism summit were all connected to the effort of combating Al-Qaeda and global terrorism. U.S. President Clinton sent a letter of gratitude to President Ramos for his government's efforts in combating terror. Some of the credit was given to SAF. They're kind of the unsung heroes behind the scenes in so many things. The work that they do on a daily basis is often not recognized as how important the Philippine police, uh, NBI, and the intelligence community are uh, when it comes to uh, stopping plots like this. Yung jail warden, sabi niya, sap, sap, uh, dito kayo. Can you imagine uh, you are looking at a building that is four-story building? and you have 489 inmates. Uh, sino ang kalaban mo doon? If this does not come out successful, they will hang me. It was just an ordinary day in March, made extraordinary by what was about to take place. March 15, 2005, 6 a.m. Police Inspector Ronald Cayago was sleeping in the SAF barracks in Bikutan when he was awakened by the alarming sound of gunfire. Yung isang tao namin, ginising ako, sir, uh, sabi niya, may putukan sa jail. Almost mga 100 meters lang kami galing dun sa jail. 
Without hesitation, kinuha ko yung M4 ko sa upper bank. Fresh pa rin sa mind ko, nakalimutan ko na magsuot ng medyas dahil sa pagmamadali ko. At saka nakasibilyan lang ako. So, nung patakbo na ako sa Bicotan Jail, dumami ng dumami yung putok. Sabi ko, iba na to. Meeting up with other troopers, Kayago advanced toward the BJMP facility only to be met by gunshots. Nasa front ng Sika building, pinuputokan na kami ng inmate. So, cover fire at saka nag-return fire kami. Sika is the special intensive care area of the jail where the most high-risk inmates are unknown to Kayago, who was up against over 100 members of the Abu Sayyaf group, detained for their involvement in their crimes against humanity. Medyo magulo. Yun. Tapos nagsisigawan, parang rally sa loob na sinabi ng jail guard, sir, 100 plus yung Abu Sayyaf inmates doon. Medyo kinabahan ako. Kaya kada putok ko, kada return fire, nag-change mag ako for a fresh magasin. Sabi ko, pag lumabas ng bulto, Sigurado ma-overrun yung position natin. Kaya sabi ko, ano lang, prepare for the worst. Nag-order ako dun sa mga kasama ko na i-recover yung uh, jail guards kasi may gumagapang pa eh. Habang nagre-recover yung uh, tropa ko, inuputokan na naman kami. So wala kami choice kundi mag-return fire at saka cover fire para ma-save yung ibang wounded. Pero... Sobrang malapit kami sa kanila kasi sinisigawan kami nila ng kung matatapang kayo, pumasok kayo. Sinasagot namin, kung matatapang kayo, lumabas din kayo. Ganun. Hindi rin namin mapasok-pasok agad kasi bakit? Inisip ko, kakainin kami pag pinasok namin. So, nag-hold the line kami doon sa main gate. Nagpapark ako ng car. That was about uh, before 7.30. So, mayamay na may narinig akong putukan agad. Uh, at as nalaman ko na binanggit sa akin na sir, may mga tumatakas na preso. Heading the crisis response group, Magalong quickly deployed his men, relieving the first responders. When then SAF director Marcelino Franco arrived at the scene, he immediately took the lead as ground commander. My role will be uh, to address the tactical side of the crisis in coordination with the crisis committee. A crisis management committee was formed to assess the situation and manage negotiations with the Abu Sayyaf group. But while demands were being discussed, Plan B was already underway. Anything can happen, so dapat meron kang standby force na naka, nandun malapit sa lugar, so that if anything happen, meron kang madideploy. The negotiation is ongoing. We're already starting to plan yung assault plan. First is, alamin mo yung situation, sino yung kalaban. Make up ng 489 inmates. Everybody is charged with heinous crimes. Ano yung weak spot ng building, ano yung mga potential avenues of approaches, potential entry points, weak uh, breaching areas, ano yung from the inside. We need all this information para we can really come up with a good assault plan. Magalong's assault plan involved two teams, one assaulting from the ground, the other from the roof. Meanwhile, snipers would be deployed in the perimeter to provide covering fire. Inmates would then be evacuated to a designated holding area for safety. You have to understand that um, as, a, as a tactical commander, the primordial concern is, uh, you know, you uh, resolve the incident and everybody's alive, including the hostage takers. You know, pinaka ultimate objective. After 24 hours of fruitless negotiation, the crisis committee ordered the assault. The hostage takers were given 15 minutes to surrender. Sabi ko, okay, uh, those who are not involved, yung mga hindi kasali, sabi ko, magtanggal na kayo ng inyong mga damit at mag-brief na lang kayo. Bakit ko binigay yung instruction na yun? Kasi sabi ko sa mga tao, it's so easy to see whether someone has a firearm or not. Isa nakatago, di ba? So, after the 15 minutes of lapse, well, I said, go. Oh. Kita mo sa loob, pag napunta ka sa Sika, walang cover doon. Ang cover mo lang siguro, isang poste na ganito lang. Yan lang, six by six na poste. Huwag ka lang magko-cover. Kailangan talaga, ang clearing mo is cell by cell, floor by floor. Hanggang mag-meet kami doon sa second floor or kaya first floor.
One thing I really appreciate is General Franco. Franco, despite yung heavy exchange of fire sa loob, uh, pagtingin ko, nandun lang siya, malapit lang siya, nandun lang siya sa banda sa, kung ko, sa likod ko. Eh. Sumusunod din siya. If your men will see you there, their morale will be high. At saka makikita nila na sabi nila kung ikaw nando doon eh sila pa. It was a very critical incident. You know? Anybody can get hurt. Being a commander, you have to be in front just to make sure na nandito ako, kasama ko kayo rito. So let us move together, finish this job and then let's go home. Everybody go some life. Sabi ko gumapang kayo. We told them where to go. So makikita mo, parang train yan eh. Train of human na gumagapang. Misa sa, sa hagdan, talaga makikita mo yan. No? As people go out, I'm, I have felt relief. You know, kasi sabi ko, wow, na, nasisave natin itong mga tao. 48 SAF troopers entered the Sika building that day. After one hour of battle, 470 prisoners were evacuated unharmed, while 23 Abu Sayyaf inmates were killed. One SAF trooper died during the clearing operation. And I became sad when afterwards, during the clearing operation, someone died. But I said, this is part of our work. And uh, we aim for a perfect operation, but it's so hard to achieve one, a perfect operation. It was an ordinary day in March that tested SAF's ability to respond quickly to crisis situations and defeat any threat it encounters in the fight against crime. The culture of excellence at SAF, it should be replicated. It's very basic, but it's proper. It is the way, it's how things should be. I'm SAF by heart, through and through. In the past 29 years, the Special Action Force has proven to be special in defending freedom, peace, and democracy. From being a battalion-sized unit in the early 80s, SAF has expanded to seven battalions with two more battalions on the drawing board. While some consider this a sign of success, others question its wisdom. Doubtful that expansion would keep SAF special. Ang main challenge dito is uh, while we're increasing the troop ceiling of our unit, we have to be able to maintain the quality. Of course, may improve din yung equipment. Mabigyan din ng equipment yung mga madadagdag na tao. Kasi right now, even without these two new battalions, medyo kulang na rin kami. We have to replace the equipment. Yung iba nasira na, so kulang na. And uh, malaking challenge yan, not only for SAP, but also to the BNP leadership. We need them because it is an elite force. It is a multi-role force. It is the best maneuver unit of the uh, Philippine National Police. My recommendation is to review uh, the SAF organization, mission and functions, re-examine whether it is right to go back to its original concept of having a super elite unit that can be deployed by the chief of the Philippine National Police in a crisis situation instantly anywhere in the country. That would be a, an, a course of action that, that I could recommend. I hope that PC staff will continue to increase its capabilities through the support of their uh, commanders up above and uh, by the president himself, who is the commander-in-chief of all armed forces, including all police forces, because they do need uh, special equipment. That is evolved over time, but it is still a skill in coordination, intelligence and in operations that really could spell the difference between defeat or victory.
As SAF looks to the future, it faces many challenges, but the one that will spell the difference in its evolution is whether it can preserve its essence as a special action force, men and women doing ordinary things extraordinarily well, and fulfilling its Tagaligtas role as it was originally conceived.